believe I'm sitting next to Ron Maxwell. Is it all right for me to fawn over you just marginally before uh, we start? I love fawning. I love fawning. Fawn away. <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, first of all, congratulations, because what a beautiful film. And I know it's not the first of yours to have been made, but it's certainly great to have one here in Atlanta, Canada that was made in Atlanta, Canada. Tell me about filming in New Brunswick. Well, you're quite right, Stephanie. This movie was made entirely here. I think there are only four non-Canadians on the entire production cast crew. That would be me. Yes. Uh, the uh, the producer director. Uh, that would be um, the cinematographer Case Van Ostrom, uh, and the editor Mark Pollan, and the music director David Franco. Everyone else on this picture is from Halifax or Fredericton. Which is wonderful. And I mean. Again, this is not an area that's new to you in terms of capturing on the screen, but what about that setting in King's Landing? Like, could you have asked for a better... No, uh, when I arrived on that, in that place, I thought, how did they know 60, 70 years ago when they put this town together that it was exactly what I needed to make Copperhead? I yeah. thought that was really visionary thinking yes, on, the, on the part of those <laughs> um, you know, town elders. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Of course, we, we know the story. I learned the story of how that uh, valley was flooded to create right. the hydroelectric plant. Yeah. And the people said, we have to save some of this architecture. This is our heritage. This yeah. is where our ancestors lived. I find that so deeply moving because that, that's a huge effort and a commitment yeah. on the part of people to do that. And then they saved all these buildings and then they just kind of warehoused them for a while. And then the next generation came along and said, let's make them live again. Isn't that extraordinary? It is. It is. And now you have people uh, from Fredericton and the surrounding areas who are uh, like kind of docents. They learn to live as people did in the yeah. 19th century and they learn different crafts and skills and the way people worked on the farm and in rural communities. So you go into that place, you're in a time warp. Yes. And the people are into it. They also have a treasure trove of furniture. Uh, in the real world, it's called furniture and antiques. We call it set dressing. Yes. <laughs> and in a normal movie, your set dressing crew has to go all over creation to find these things on a historical piece. Most of what we needed, we found in their collection uh, that people had donated over the years. So we had to redress rooms to make it work for the movie and, and, and move things around. So it, took a, it still took a lot of pre-production to get it ready to shoot. But my goodness, we started at such an advantage. Yes. And no matter where you are in King's Landing, no matter where you put the camera, you could see out to the edge of the town and there would be open fields and farmland right. exactly the way North American towns were in the middle of the 19th century, which is very difficult to find now oh, in North goodness, America. Yes. Let's talk about this story because you're a wonderful storyteller and this I know was a book and how did you even get it attached to it and how did you bring it to life? Well, I'm reading fiction all the time. I love to read all yeah. sorts of fiction. And part of my reading is uh, uh, Civil War fiction. Right. Because I've always got in the back of my mind, oh, maybe there'll be one, <laughs> one more movie on the Civil War. And it's also because I'm asked to do this kind of a movie. <clears throat> and um, over the 20 or so years that I had made uh, first Gettysburg and then Gods and Generals, I came to realize, Stephanie, that uh, those, were, those pictures taken together are cinematic meditations on why good, honorable, ethical men choose to go to war. Right. And I thought I understood that guy because my father was a guy like that. He enlisted and fought in World War II. He was just a great guy. I, I miss him every day. Yeah. And, and he was part of a generation of Americans, Canadians, Canadians, uh, uh, Brits who, who, who made that commitment and, and paid a heavy price. But along the way of making those movies, uh, another question uh, arose for me, which was, uh, where are the men of equivalent honor and ethic, ethics and morality who choose not to go to war. Right. And so when I read uh, Harold Frederick's novel that was published in 1893 called The Copperhead, which is about such a man, as I say, I was predisposed and very receptive to the material. And as you know, you talk to a lot of filmmakers, you have to really connect with the material. Well, because it's a commitment. <laughs> I mean, it's a commitment. It doesn't just, we, don't, we see the big picture and it's done, but you've been working on it for a long time. Well, when you start down that road, and when I, I talk often to uh, film school students across, across North America, and, um, and one of the things I tell them is if, if you find a project, if, if you're not willing to commit the rest of your life to it, don't commit a day. Right. Because you, it may take the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. And you better know it, year three and year five, you're still committed to it. 
Now, we don't have crystal balls. We can't tell how we're going to feel. But, it, but what it does tell you, what it does inform you, is that you better really connect with the material. That better re be the reason you want to do it. Right. No other reason. Right. The material, you have to feel that you are the unique storyteller in the world to tell this story. It's got to be that much of an imperative. So you start down this road, and in this case, it was like a three and a half year curve from the time uh, I thought this is a movie worth making. I read it earlier, but, but when Bill Kaufman and I, the writer, we, we met over breakfast, we were on an entirely different subject, and the Copperhead came up. This was about three and a half years ago. Right. We said, wow, this would make a great movie. It's such an unknown story, yeah. uh, the, the, the story of the um, resistance, the anti-war resistance in the North, uh, most Americans don't know about. The war between the states, that's what Abner Beach called it. It had been going on for a year before it really got to us in the upper part of New York State. They called us people in the North that didn't want the war, copperheads. We were far from the battles. At least, I thought we were. Springtime, 1862. That's when the war came home, and nothing was ever the same again. I don't want to see politics tear our community apart. It already has. I do not want our boys dying, and I don't want the Constitution dying with them. Well, you talk about telling the story, and so much of that relies on a great cast, and I mean, you did it. How did you put that together? I couldn't be happier with this cast. It is the perfect cast. Every single person on that screen inhabits that role, is that role, yeah. owns that role. Uh, and I hasten to add, not only were they perfect for the roles, but what a bunch of really nice people. Yeah. What a wonderful way to spend right. a few weeks with this cast, a sheer joy. Early on, we made a decision that we were going to cast uh, six of the parts um, uh, out of Los Angeles from the entire pool of Anglophonic actors, whether they're from New Zealand or England and everyone in between. And then the rest of the cast, which is about 25, 25 or so parts, we'd cast it out of Halifax. And uh, uh, Sheila Lane and Zoe, uh, her crew, they brought in all these wonderful uh, actors from the Maritimes who yes. play these roles. Right. I wonder, too, now that it's all done and you've spent all this time and now it's finally on the big screen, how are you feeling about it? Well, I'm very pleased with the film. It's the film I wanted to make. Um, I think it's got uh, an emotional power to it. Uh, I think it's... Uh, Case Van Ostrom, my cameraman, I call him my cameraman. He, may, yeah. he works for other directors, too. <laughs> uh, we, we share a, a deep aesthetic. And the way we make movies, it's very composed. It's, it, it's in the genre of classical filmmaking. Right. We're not moving the camera all over the place. And I don't criticize that. It's, I love watching all sorts of movies in all sorts of styles. But the style that I thought was appropriate for Copperhead, which was also appropriate for my other two Civil War movies, is a classical genre of filmmaking. It draws you in, I find. Yeah. And also the pace is unlike most modern films because I feel that to get to the 19th century world, part of the, what you have to capture is the pace of living, which is a pace completely geared and tied to the solar lunar clock. They got up and worked when, it was, uh, when the sun was out, as long as the sun was out, and then when the sun went down, they went into their m different mode but they weren't rushing around. Uh, being in a hurry in the 19th century is defined differently yeah. than being in a hurry in our I sometimes lives. I wish I lived at King's Landing. Is that wrong? <laughs> I mean. Well, it's a slower, so, so to get into that slower rhythm, yeah. uh, it's, it's part of what you do in rehearsal, and it's also part of what, how you shoot a film and how you edit a film. Now, some people get ants in their pants when they, when they see a movie like that and they just can't take it. They say, they're, they're so addled, they're, 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 their brains have been so addled by, the, by MTV and the way many movies are made today that they say, this is too slow for me, and they bail. Right. Um, but I, had, I got an interesting reaction from uh, a co-ed uh, 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 in Lynchburg at Liberty University who saw the film uh, at a screening we had early on last May. And she came uh, with uh, a couple of her professors, and she was 18 or 19. And in the Q&A afterwards, she said, uh, Mr. Maxwell, uh, I got to tell you, I didn't want to see this film. I came because my professor suggested I should come. 
it started, she said, and I thought, oh, I'm never going to last. It's going to be the most unendurable two hours of my life. Oh, no. But she said, I don't know what, when it happened, but before I knew it, I was completely involved right. and completely, I said, she said, but the, I've never seen a film pace like this, and I don't know what happened to me, but I said, I ended up crying, and I, I'm deeply moved, and I want to see it again. I said to her, I said, it's not your fault. Right. You're conditioned. We... It's very difficult for filmmakers to make a movie where we determine the pace of the story without worrying about what some studio head or what some network head is. It's too fast, speed it up. So I said, it's not your fault. You're just not seeing right. movies like this. Now I said, go to Netflix or whatever you're, where you can find older movies, you'll see lots of them. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a certain style of filmmaking which is geared to the characters where the pace of the film is not imposed on the characters. Right. It takes a certain courage, and it also takes a certain peace of mind, which now that I'm in my 60s, I can say I've acquired and I've earned. So I pace the movie the way I think it's appropriate to tell the story, right. and I do not worry one hoot about what anybody else is going to say. There you go. Well, it's funny because I, I, I gleaned a certain amount of autonomy in terms of how this film was made and that it was very much your picture. And I wondered how that felt showing it to the hometown crowd in New Brunswick because there was so much um, fanfare made about this film and I, the anticipation to see it at the Playhouse would, must have been extraordinary. How was that? That was really an electrified evening. Yes. Uh, cause Everybody who came, that, that was our cast and crew screening. Yes. Uh, that was not for the public, that was for everybody who worked on it at the King's Landing, the, the background people from Fr Fredericton. Uh, some of the cast came down, uh, uh, people who, suppliers, vendors. It, it was really a hometown experience and it was really thrilling. That audience, uh, you know, it, we all love box office results, we love to get good critical reviews. But you know the most meaningful thing I've learned over the years? How does the audience respond? That audience was on its feet. They weren't just giving us a standing ovation. No. They were cheering. Right. They were cheering. And uh, I've been to many screenings now. And, and uh, like that young lady who came up to me in Lynchburg, that's what I've learned. That's the meaningful thing. Because that's what a film is essentially at its core. It's connecting the filmmaker with the film viewer. You can't have one without the other, yeah. obviously. Right. And not only connecting in real time, but connecting across time. Because think about it. Yeah. The people in this story lived in 150 years ago. And people will see this film in technologies not yet invented in future generations. And so we are midwives. Right. We are, we are a, like holding hands across the generations and saying this is our human experience. And the reaction on a one-by-one -one basis, that's the reward and that's why we do it. Everything else, the box office results, what the critics say, all this stuff, the ratings, they're kind of little um, numbers in a ledger, but it's not the heart of the matter. Right. We're dealing here, even though we have to what deal with... What a refreshing terms... perspective from Mr. Ron Maxwell. <laughs> Well, it's, it, we know it's a business, yes. and, I, and I've learned to, to work in the yeah. context of a business. You have to raise money, you need investors, you need to sell things. Right. And, uh, and you're helping us in, a, in, a, in an immeasurably important way sell things, because we, the public has to know this movie is there. So right. this is all important stuff, right. but we mustn't be confused about it, because essentially what we're doing is tell, telling stories in a maybe more sophisticated way than our ancestors did, but that's what it's about. It's about a human connection across time. And I think the other thing when I've come to understand that, when you understand that, you automatically respect your audience and yeah. you give your audience a lot of credit that the audience will come to you. You don't have to pander. You don't have to cater. You don't have to talk down. You don't have to keep them razzle dazzle. Oh, they're going to lose their interest. No. Respect the audience and the audience will respect the film. Well, well, well. Why don't you come on in here and tell me a war story? The war between the states. That's what Abner Beach called it. It'd been going on for a year before it really got to us in the upper part of New York State. They called us people in the North that didn't want the war copperheads. We were far from the battles. At least, I thought we were. 
Springtime, 1862. That's when the war came home, and nothing was ever the same again. But I don't want to see politics tear our community apart. It already has. I do not want our boys dying. And I don't want the Constitution dying with them. They say there's been discovered a big conspiracy about secret sympathizers all over the North. Tell the old man and Ma I'm going to enlist in the Army. He snuck out behind our backs. Say you won't marry him. Why would I marry Tom Beach? I see the way you look at him. There's a time for carrying the sword. We got a serpent in our own backyard here. Admiral Beach is a copperhead, and the copperhead is a snake. Mr. Beach, they're coming here tonight. Heaven only knows what they're going to do when they get here. Come on out, comrade! Hell for traitor! 141 killed, 560 wounded, 38 missing. Great armies being raised. Hundreds of thousands of honest men set to murder in each other. In the face of all this madness, what happened to love thy neighbor? Blessed are the peacemakers. Is that still in the Bible? <laughs>